Okay, hello, I, I'm Jürgen. Uh, I used to work at the university, but I'm uh, out of funding right now. I'm finishing my PhD. And usually I talk about cuneiform, which is a programming language I made. Uh, but today I'm, I'm talking about uh, uh, how I actually did the, the distribution stuff in it. And that's uh, modeled with Petrinets. And uh, Petrinets uh, are quite useful and also in comparison to state machines. And uh, you as the Erlang community, uh, I guess, know a lot about state machines, but Petrinets are even better, and that's why we're uh, talking about Petrinets today. So um, what are Petrinets? Petrinets are a, a notation for systems from uh, some of the 60s. Uh, the good thing about it is they're graphical, so you can look at them and you can read them and you can draw them on a on a blackboard. Uh, but they still have, uh, even though they have a graphical um, representation, uh, defined semantics. So it's not just uh, um, uh, connecting bubbles with arrows, uh, but that this also means something. And this, uh, you don't have to understand this uh, example here below, but that's how a patronet looks like. Uh, I will give a short introduction to what everything means in there. So first, um, there's a little story b b about this. Uh, so in two two 2003, uh, Mr. Reinke here wrote a paper about Petrinet's, uh, a pe a colored Petrinet implementation on Haskell. And he thought, well, uh, uh, the Erlang guys, you know, they, they do something with uh, distribution. Petrinets are good for distribution. Let's, let's write them an email and tell them, hey, there's this uh, thing I did with Haskell, and you, uh, you probably might be looking into that too. And this uh, is 15 years ago, and I'm here to like, report or uh, propose that this is actually a very good idea, and we should have picked it up much earlier. And we could have picked it up uh, 15 years ago, but uh, let's see what we can still make of the situation. So yeah, nothing else happened, and now I'm I'm giving you a short overview about uh, how we uh, model systems with Petronets. So uh, a, a Petronet is essentially a graphical uh, notation, and one thing. So th whenever there is a circle, circles are places. Places are uh, passive, that means they are something like a stream or a buffer or a piece of memory, something that can hold something. And uh, so places are always round. And the other thing that Petronets have is uh, transitions. And transitions are active, so they are like operations or functions, uh, something like that. And these are connected as a, uh, as a direct graph. And um, and the places that are before a transition are called the transitions preset, and the transitions, uh, the places after the transition are the called the, the places, uh, the transitions post set, and that's important uh, because a transition always consume consumes one of the things uh, from each of the places of its preset, and produces one uh, one of these things on the arcs. Uh, on all of the places of its post set. So that's essentially uh, everything there is to know about Petrinets. Yeah, and, uh, and, on, a, and on a place, so on, a, on a s something that can store something, there's tokens, and these tokens um, are consumed and produced by these transitions. <laughs> Later they're called coins too, yeah. Yeah, and this is essentially what happens then. Yeah, when we when we look at how this can go from here, so uh, there's three tokens on in the preset of a transition. So the transition is enabled; it can it can fire, and when it fires, it consumes uh, one of each of the things in its preset and produces one of each of these things in the in the in the post set. Yeah, that's essentially this. This is what a transition does. And what we see here is uh, wh what we call an elementary Petrinet. 
But there's several kinds of Petri nets, and uh, one uh, kind of Petri net that is very dear to my heart is uh, uh, high-level nets. So we can we can make tokens uh, be anything, any any data, and we can also make the transitions make uh, any um, computation. And when you allow that, 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 uh, that then we call this a high-level Petri net. And the other thing that uh, is very important also because we're uh, programming Erlang, is that we're looking at interface nets. That means that uh, some of the places of the net are actually at the boundary of the system, at the, at the interface. And on the interface of a net, uh, it can receive messages and send messages away. <coughs> so that's how uh, everything plays together, right? Uh, that's how we make a Petronet, uh, in the end, appear as an Erlang process. And uh, this is, again, the example from the first slide. So now that we know uh, what all this means, uh, we can tell that if we put a coin yeah, in the coin slot, then, uh, then the A transition is enabled. And, it, and if it fires, it uh, puts the coin in the cash box. And also, a signal gets produced. And then the B transition is enabled and will put one of the cookie boxes in the compartments. And this uh, can happen three times. Then the storage is empty. And then it will just consume coins and never give you anything. <laughs> <laughs> so that and also, because the storage is not on the interface, there's no way you could ever uh, put new cookie boxes in there. Yes, this is a closed system. Only the coin slot and the compartment are actually at the interface. So, and this is also how I, uh, it's intended to be used. Yeah, if it's not on the on the interface, you shouldn't do anything uh, uh, with it except what you defined the patronet behavior to be inside. Okay, and uh, as I as the uh, the title of the talk uh, suggests a little bit, uh, it has something to do with finite state machines and also. Uh, uh, in Erlang, we use finite state, state machines a lot, and that's why I make a little comparison with uh, finite state machines now. So this is essentially a rant yeah, on finite state machines. But uh, that's, uh, I have to do this in order to sell this somehow. Uh, so let's say we're an automotive company, and we're building cars. And cars in, in this world are uh, very simple cars. They have a light, which you can uh, turn on and off, and they have a gearbox, and you can uh, shift into uh, in, in rear, no gear at all, uh, and, and there's two other gears. So if I if I want to model this as a as a state machine, I, w I would come up with something like that. Uh, is, is everybody okay with this with this representation? Or yeah. So uh, the the beginning state is here in the, the where the lights are off and we have no um, uh, gear. And then we can either switch, uh, shift up or down or turn the lights on or off. And the, the, the problem with this representation is that whenever we, we add a variable, yeah, here we have only two li variables, light and gear. But when, when we add variables, we're, we're essentially uh, having a state space explosion. So. Uh, each variable uh, um, makes the number of states we need to represent the system n times as large if n is the number of um, realizations that ver ver variable can have. So but we, uh, if we want to represent this as a, a Petri net, it could look like this. Um, and here, uh, we don't get the state space explosion. So we, if we add to the gear shifting uh, the switching lights on and off, since these operations are essentially independent, uh, th this doesn't do anything to the, to the gear shifting. So we can add variables, and sure, we make the, uh, the system bigger, but you don't get the state space explosion. And another thing that is uh, quite important is that between these um, variables, uh, light and gear, there's actually no uh, connection. So these are completely independent aspects of the system. In a Petri net, you can see that they're independent. 
but in the uh, state machine, uh, they're always uh, somehow coupled, even though they don't actually have to do something with, uh, with one another. And another thing that can happen is, uh, well, there's for, for plenty of use cases, the state machine that we actually needed to have is, uh, is infinite. So a very uh, simple example is a counter. Yeah, we start in the zero state, and we can add one, then we, we come to another state. But, but uh, to represent all the natural numbers, we, you, we would have to have essentially an infinite uh, state machine. But that's not practical uh, if we have to code this then at some point. And the, the, uh, the Petrinet for that would be quite finite. So some th for, uh, for the same use case, we have, uh, if we encode it as a state machine, we need uh, an infinite representation, while uh, as a Petrinet, we only need two transitions and a place to have the same thing, essentially. And so chances are, if, if you're using um, state machines, that you're al already doing a lot right. Yeah, this is not uh, uh, telling you you shouldn't use state machines. The opposite is the case. You should model and you should use state machines. But, uh, but there are situations where state machines just can't help you. And, and uh, there's also cases where also patterns can't help you. But sometimes, yeah, there's these cases where uh, 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 a, a state machine is at its limits, but a, but a pattern is not. And that's actually more often than one might expect. So to summarize the, the downsides of finite state machines, essentially, you, you get a state, sp state spa space explosion when you add variables. Um, you can either completely separate state machines, then they're independent, or you have to uh, somehow put them together. Uh, but there's no in-between. There's no, um, they, they can't be sometimes independent and sometimes dependent, that it has to always be one or the other. And the, other, uh, and the third thing is uh, that you can get uh, quite easily in the situation where your uh, state machines are infinite. So, enough about the theory. Now let's have a look at how uh, one writes this down in Erlang, because that's uh, what I hope so, uh, yeah, w will come out of this. So this is, uh, again, the example. Uh, we have we have uh, five places and two transitions and coins go in and cookie boxes come out. So yeah, uh, and now let's look at how we would write this down in Erlang. So uh, first of all, we would create a module and we will we would uh, tell it to uh, uh, behave like a genfinet. Yeah, so that's essentially just the introduction. So and the first thing. I have to give it is uh, a method, uh, uh, a function that returns the number, uh, not the number, but but all the names of all the places in there. So first, I have to give Erlang a notion of the of the structure of the patronet. And the second thing is uh, I have to enumerate in the same way uh, all the transitions in there. This is just these two. And and then. Uh, I need to tell Erlang uh, what the preset of all the transitions are. So, uh, as we see in the example, uh, the preset of A is just the coin slot, and the preset of B is the storage and the signal. And this is also what we, uh, what we write down in Erlang. We don't have to give it anything about the post set, but the, uh, it has to know the preset. Um, the third thing that it needs to know is the is what the initial marking is of that patronet. So all the tokens that are in the patronet from the start, and these are just these three cookie boxes, and all other places, no matter how they are called, are empty. And um, the next thing I need to know is uh, when a transition is enabled. And this is a predicate on uh, on the ways I can I can consume tokens uh, uh, by uh, on the way uh, a transition can consume tokens. So, for example, um, when a coin is in the coin slot, 
then then the, the transition A is enabled. When we have a signal on the play signal and a cookie box in the storage, then the transition B is enabled. But in all other cases, uh, no transition is uh, ever enabled. So the, the is enabled predicate tells me when I can actually use a transition. And the last thing I need is what happens when the transition fires. So uh, when A fires, it produces a coin in the, in the cache box and a signal in, in on, uh, uh, on the signal place. And when B fires, it produces a cookie box in the compartment. And that is everything I need in order to tell Erlang what this patronet does. And uh, th it turns out this is quite useful. Um, so uh, in order to find out whether... Do you, ha you have a question? Exactly. So uh, the question was uh, whether the transition A is enabled if there's one coin or if there's several coins or what happens if there's several coins, right? And this is exactly right. There can be any number of tokens on one place. And since on the arc here there's just one coin appearing, it will just consume one coin from the input place. And all the other coins will be left alone. So this um, transition A here is if there's three coins in the coin slot, uh, it can fire three times until it runs out of coins. And in the meantime, you could insert new coins. It doesn't matter, uh, the timing doesn't matter for this particular case. <coughs> okay. Uh, what uh, the It could be a set, you mean. Uh, so the question is, why do I let the user return lists instead of, for example, sets or, or stuff like that? Well is it because it's, uh, I'm wondering about the is enabled and why. Ah, okay. So, so why don't you just put one asset there? The yes. This is because there could be several uh, arcs from the same place to the same transition. So uh, imagine if one cookie costs two coins, then I could have another arc, which, also, uh, which is also labeled coin, from this place here. And then A is only enabled if I have, uh, if, if the firing mode, as it is called, is uh, two coins from the uh, coin slot uh, place. So that's why I have a list here instead of just a single atom. That's the question, right? There was another uh, thing, I think. No? Okay. Okay, and then this is a pretty, uh, together with Erlang, uh, Erlang's way of pattern matching, this is a pretty concise notation of a, a pattern. So it would be much harder in other languages that don't uh, have pattern matching. And uh, I tried to apply this a little bit, so... Uh, um yeah, it shouldn't be a toy, right? It should be a really applicable library. So here's what I uh, try to do with it, and you tell me whether it's uh, production ready or not. Um, so uh, the first thing I tried was uh, to make a worker pool manager. It's called Gruff, and it's heavily inspired by Poolboy. So the, 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 the purpose of this project is not to be creative, but essentially I just wanted to know whether I can do something like Poolboy with Petronets. And since Poolboy is a very um, uh, popular repository and uh, obviously also quite important, uh, I try to do this with Petronets. So uh, what does Poolboy do, or what do I think Poolboy does, is uh, it, it starts a number of uh, worker processes, it allows clients to request workers, it allows clients to uh, return workers that when when it's when the client is finished doing something with it, and when they all workers are in use, 
uh, then Puba will wait until uh, a worker gets free, until it serves the, the request. And should workers um, fail, they will be restarted. That's essentially how I understand what, what's going on there. And if I want to uh, model this as a patronet, then it could look like this. So we see here in the in this place, we have three tokens, and this means I want to start three worker processes at some point. And this start um, um, transition here essentially takes a, a, a token out and starts a worker process. And then they're in the, on the idle place. And the happy path for requesting a worker is this one here. So I get a request from a client, then I create a monitor on the client because I want to know when the client fails. And then I allocate uh, an idle um, worker for him. Uh, and doing so makes the worker busy. And I send out a rep uh, reply to the, to the client. And the other things that the client can do is it can cancel the request before it gets, um, before it gets served. Um, or it can check in an, uh, a finished worker when it's done. And the other thing that can happen is the, the client can fail, right? And, and the beauty about Erlang is I, uh, whenever a process fails uh, and I have a monitor on it, it, g it sends me a message, right? And I can make this message appear on this place here and, and handle it in within the patronet. And uh, depending on what happens, I either restart the worker or um, uh, make it idle again. There's a question. Currently, the patronet doesn't express, for example, that on the cancel busy transition, cancel busy. the two references that are passing have to be the same, does it? Yes, exactly. Here's an R. This is a monitor reference. And here's also an R. And they have to be the same. This is this is the the meaning of what I wrote here. So if if you have two two variables on uh, on ingoing arcs to a transition and they're named the same, uh, the instantiation has to also be the same. It's a lot like Erlang pattern matching, and I use Erlang pattern matching to get that behavior. Yeah, Th so that's that's pretty much intentional. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this is uh, this works. Uh, yeah, as, as uh, I didn't use it in production, but <laughs> as far as I can tell, it's it's good, and it's also not exactly the same thing as Poolboy does, but uh, with with slight variations. Uh, but yeah, pretty much this. And the the actual reason I uh, came up with with these patronets is because I wanted to have have uh, Kineform, my programming language, my distributed programming language. Uh, on top of something I, I can understand and, and I can model. So the other obvious application is, of course, this uh, wonderful uh, distributed programming language. Uh, what is Kineform? So it's a large-scale data analysis platform. It's also a workflow language and a build tool. You can use it in one of, the of these three um, scenarios. And there's two things that are important. It's, it's both open and general, and open means that you can uh, integrate whatever uh, software you already have in R, in Python, uh, as command line tools in Erlang. Uh, and it's general because uh, it, it's actually a Lambda calculus. It's a, a full-fledged functional programming language. And, and this is also something you, you sometimes not don't have in, in the setting of large-scale data analysis. They offer you a lot, but Turing completeness is a different story. And uh, this is uh, this is essentially the syntax. So you can define functions. Uh, there's a simple type system. So you have to always type your uh, inputs and your outputs. But when you define a function, you can always say, OK, and now I write this in Perl. Or no, now I write this in Bash. Or now I write this in Python or Erlang. And then you can enter p uh, Perl code. And and then you can uh, call these functions and iterate over lists and all this stuff. I'm, I'm not going into detail here because uh, this talk is really not about kineform. Uh, but 
when when we think about how we make this work in the distributed case, so w w consider we have any distributed programming language. What what would, will it roughly do? Uh, so uh, this is essentially a timeline for a, a, a sequence diagram uh, uh, for a client, so a language interpreter, where, where a, a driver program gets evaluated. Then we have a scheduler, a master, which uh, schedules work to, to worker nodes. And we have two workers here. And that's essentially, the, the, the from a bird's eye view, the, the large setup. And the user gives the system an expression that's supposed to be evaluated. And uh, from this expression, the, the interpreter produces small chunks of work that are independent. And these chunks of work are sent to the scheduler. And then the scheduler uh, schedules these chunks of work to workers that, that it has available. And these workers um, produce replies. And then the reply is uh, reported back to the client. Uh, and this could look like this, yeah. We, so we have uh, four, four independent chunks of work here, but only two workers, right? So um, somehow there has to be uh, a little bit of uh, oversubscription, and then these four chunks of work get uh, done, and each time the the client does a bit of work, but but doesn't identify new work. And finally, a value gets gets returned to the user. And that's essentially very roughly what, uh, like in, in general, distributed programming might do. <coughs> and when we think about how we model this as a Petri-net, then uh, we we might notice that. S so the one thing is the interface to the user, where he can. Uh, give you a uh, an uh, expression and, and expects a value back. The other thing is the interface from the client, from the language interpreter, to the scheduler, uh, here shown in blue. And the, the third interface is the interface from the scheduler to the worker. And so when you think about how these the system is put together, you, uh, you it, it makes sense to start with these three interfaces. And to, to write this down as a patronet, you w might end up with something like this, where um, you have two places uh, as the interface for the user, where he can uh, send you a value, uh, an expression and expects a value back. Uh, then an interface, but quite similarly, for, for, the, for the scheduler, and an interface for the worker too. And not shown here is all the things that, that are done inside. Yeah, just to say what what the client does, so it loads and unloads the program. Uh, it, uh, it must reduce some expression. It suspends and redu uh, uh, resumes uh, reduction uh, when when it can. It's uh, and it uh, and it sends uh, requests and, and it uh, expects something back. And this is essentially the 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 whole thing. So. Here the program is loaded, then it gets evaluated. Sometimes something is sent away, sometimes something is received, and uh, when the program is a value, it gets returned. I'm not dwelling, d dwelling too long on this because, um, th uh, yeah, uh, uh, I actually want to talk about wanted to talk about Petronets and Cuneiform, but yeah. Um, so this is the scheduler. The scheduler also has a cache. It should be fault tolerant, so it has to react to uh, the failure of clients and workers. And it should be language independent. So this is also something, uh, maybe somebody comes with a different distributed programming language, then he should also be able to uh, use this. And this is, this is then the whole thing. And we, we see here the happy path is uh, from the client through the whole thing uh, to the worker, and back from the worker to the client. And what w uh, and there's essentially three parts in here. The one is uh, the demand lifecycle. So the, uh, this is how the system make, uh, uh, applies back pressure to the client. 
Then we have the cache here. So if a, uh, um, a request can be answered from the cache, it, doesn't, uh, it, does, it goes over this path instead of through the whole thing. And then we have uh, here uh, is where the scheduling happens. So here is where a, a, a worker, an available worker, um, gets, gets paired wi within, with a task, and this is sent away. And when the uh, reply uh, comes in, then the, then the worker is free again. Um, and the, w the worker is also patronated too. Um, this thing looks like this. So essentially there's also a happy path over here. So this is what, you th th what, what should be uh, happening. But at all stages, something can go wrong. So, for example, uh, so first the uh, worker uh, prepares all the files that are necessary. Then something gets evaluated, and then uh, there's some some work to be done afterwards. And the the worker can fail either uh, during preparation or du uh, or uh, during execution or during uh, cleaning up. So these. These three um, uh, possibilities exist, and yeah, and all this together is so, uh, is cuneiform, and the the way we use it right now is uh, most of the time for um, biologic uh, uh, next generation sequencing, large da scale data analysis uh, applications. So this is, for example, a, a, a workflow that uh, does uh, that the cause variance that is uh, that detects differences from a uh, sample uh, genome to a reference genome. And some v visualizations that come out of this. And uh, so to wrap this up, uh, fir first of all, I, d I just want to say this is, uh, this, uh, there are several people who tried something similar. Uh, um, most notably, there's uh, CPN tools, which is a graphical editor, but that that supports code generation also to Erlang. So if you're not cool with uh, with what I've shown you, you can also uh, try this one out. And there's uh, an, uh, another guy who uh, tried essentially the same thing um, uh, a couple of years ago, I think uh, seven years ago. Um, yeah. But it didn't catch on, perhaps. I don't know. Um, yeah, so uh, ending this talk, uh, I think Patreon is a very uh, good model for, for modeling. So this is a mistake. I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah, uh, and, and GenPNet, so this library I, uh, I presented here, allows you to, to make um, Patreonets on the inside and processes on the outside. So you, you can communicate in Erlang uh, with, with, with the processes uh, the way you used to do that. But on the inside, you can, you can have a, a different view on, on things. And that's about it. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>